and our responses, particularly in the light of, of uh, fresh water and carbon. Um, and, and that's fantastic and, and, and essential, of course, but it's very easy to lose sight of, of a couple of things. One is that um, people need to be able to farm profitably, uh, they need to be able to farm productively, and they need to be able to fit farm systems to the, uh, the land and the climate and the people in a way that um, provides the best outcomes. Um, and that is, and this is where I'm heading, that, that is a complex jigsaw puzzle. Right? It's, it's not easy to kind of say, um, how, do we, how do we fit a farm system best to the land and everything else that goes around that. And it's very easy in today's world of sort of 20 second sound bites to look for what's the silver bullet. Oh, we just feed, feed our cattle seaweed and we'll be right, or whatever else it might be. And we know that farm systems are complex, they have feedback loops, it's not that simple. Uh, and today we have some people in the room who have some fantastic experience and some learnings from working through farm systems in both a, a research and a practical way. So we're very excited to, to hear from those people. I'm going to invite Graham Ogle to come up now, and um, Graham's going to jump up and down during the day, uh, introducing people. Uh, and uh, I guess Graham has done a lot of work um, in recent weeks, working with many of you, organising today, and uh, on behalf of Rosia Systems, um, we're very grateful for that work as well. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Rosie has been planning to run this workshop for quite some time and it's um, a real pleasure to uh, have a room full of all the people we want here for this workshop. Um, <coughs> what I want to do is just cover why we're running the workshop and a little bit about how. Um, I think this is a, a, a chance for... Rosie has been looking for the chance to have a bit of a... Um, and I found the word the other day, a policy refresh. A strategy refresh, sorry. Um, very cool word. Uh, and we thought, what a better way, what better way is there to have a strategy refresh than invite all the right people, and you're, we think you're all the right people, to, to a venue and talk about what we see as really valuable to farmers. What is value? What is value when we say, of all the things we could provide a farmer, what are the valuable things? I, I guess I started my career, my idea of that uh, really was forged out of when I started my career in the 1980s, which meant that I had two decades of excruciatingly low product prices to work with for farmers. Uh, I remember sitting with a farmer one day, he was in trouble, the farm was going to get sold up, and I thought, if we get $35 a lamb, you'd be right. And of course, the markets weren't delivering that. N now, you can adjust that by whatever you like, whatever inflation index you like. The CPI would mean that farmers today would be getting $55 a lamb. And I imagine our budgeting would be even more difficult today given the increase in costs. Dairy farmers were getting $2.40 a kilo of milk, milk solids. I mean, it's almost unheard of. And if we ramp that up by the CPI, we'd be talking about a payout today of $3.70. So this, this was a sort of the anvil that forged my early career. And uh, going out to do things for farmers that were of value, the biggest value we could do for farmers then was increase their profitability. And that uh, started to address all the other problems that were on the farm. So, <clears throat> when Rosia set out, as we, we did uh, in 2004, uh, as a group dedicated to agricultural uh, software development, often we sit around and think, is our strategy aligned with where the value is in the industry? Are we aligning our investment and resources where the value resides in the industry? So what we're going to do today is we're going to think how might we align our investment with what top farmers are saying is important to them. And I can't think of any better way to start this workshop than listening to some top farmers. So that's what we're doing. 
I think uh, consulting is also an extension of farming, and we'll listen to consultants after that. The farmers that we'll listen to have been through some process of change or intensive planning. Um, and it's from those discussions that we hope you'll pick up some things about what they value. And maybe uh, a, a successful outcome of this workshop is if you go home and think, hey, maybe we need a strategy refresh as well. Um, so, so next, uh, I thought after listening to consultants, uh, we'd rock on and listen to the levy paid uh, farmer, farmer organisations who, um, their, their jobs to see, to, to look at farming, see where it's at, uh, see what hurdles there are and, and, and develop programs to, to benefit the industry. Um, so we'll, we'll start off um, with Martin Coop, who's. Uh, <laughs> we, we won't start off. We won't start off with Martin Coop because he's next after Mark Neal. Well, here's, here's an agenda in case you haven't seen one. <laughs> <laughs> right, excellent. Uh, thanks, Graham. Um, the uh, yeah, so we had a really good discussion from a farmer perspective and from a consultant perspective. Um, uh, what we need to do on farm to get better performance. Uh, from a, um, I guess, a sector perspective, what do we need to do to be competitive is where I'm coming from. So, um, what do we mean by competitiveness? Um, and there's a few different aspects to this. And um, yeah, Matt, this riffs off a definition that we put together uh, a few years ago. Uh, the dairy sector provides what the world wants. Um, uh, you need a market to sell it to that's happy to take that product uh, with decent returns on all the capital, labour and other inputs. So uh, that's uh, people um, getting into the picture again. And if we're going to do that, we need to think about who our competitors are in this space. So we can think of other grass-fed producers. So Ireland is probably um, a really good example of that. Um, but particularly in the R&D space, there is almost nothing we can do that we can stop them using. Um, so that pre-competitive space is really where we should be working together on a lot of the issues that are common to both of us. Okay, uh, with other, other styles of competitors, we think of like crop or total mixed ration based um, dairy farming and the US is a pretty good example of that. Um, and then we have substitutes. And so substitutes aren't new. Um, you know, soy and almond have been around a long, you know, a while, uh, but we're seeing, you know, animal free alternatives, you know, and a different value proposition with a different footprint, um, et cetera. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. But if I just want to focus on what we're not, um, Let's uh, take the US example. So here's one of the largest farms in the US, 40,000 cows, 450 staff. That is a farm that's been systematised. Um, silage is 65% of their total cost, um, and that's 80% maize, 15% grass. And so, you know, there's lots of country in the US that is good at growing maize. Um, uh, also growing hillbillies as well, but that's beside the point. Um, and 15% grass um, silage. So what does this mean for the competitiveness um, of their sector and what that looks like? So here's some data out of the US and the blue line is basically what happens to uh, cost per unit as you increase herd size. And so it declines pretty rapidly to start with and it keeps declining, but at a slower rate. And that green line was the price um, in, uh, in 2016. So you could see that um, you know, under 500 cows, most of those farmers were not making any money. Okay? So that's a lot of pressure for change. But at the top end, most of the farms, in terms of size, most of the farms were making money. So that's driving rapid change over there. So a lot less farms. Um, dry, dry, um, indeed, my traditional area, I think last year, lost 10% of its um, dairy farms um, 
you know, small dairy farms. So it's moving away from some of those traditional regions and indeed there was a big flight to um, the west um, but now it's more, um, you know, some of those places like, um, uh, well, Midwest-ish. Uh, away from pasture, so there's less and less pasture being used over time um, and doing higher and higher production per cow. Uh, so you've got large efficient farms and what's concerning is that they've actually got a positive trend in their operating profit margin. Over time, their margin is improving where that is not the case for pretty much anywhere else in the world. Okay, but if we're now, if we, that's where we don't want to be. Um, um, where are we? So in pasture-based systems, once you get to about 500 cows, this is uh, Canterbury figures, um, once you get to about 500 cows, so a couple of uh, labour units fully utilised, you've captured most of those economies of size um, and thereafter it's pretty flat and with some evidence that potentially it even turns, uh, turns back up and you're less, of, less efficient at very large sizes. Um, this is certainly the case in Australia, uh, lots of um, uh, anecdotal examples of where uh, you end up with a size and you end up with a, a herd manager in the dairy trying to make as much milk as they can and the easiest way to do that is to pull the, pull the grain handle and then you've got a field manager trying to get good utilisation out in the paddock and they're tearing their hair out because the bloody cows won't eat the grass um, and that's where completely the wheels fall off. So we don't see that to the same extent in, um, um, in New Zealand but yeah I think there's a good argument that basically over reasonable ranges um, there's not much in the way of economies of size. So what do we want to conclude? So we don't want to try and be the US. Uh, milk solids per cow doesn't um, equal profit. Um, uh, did some work looking at um, milk solids um, per kilo, kilos of milk solids per kilo of live weight. And basically there are farms doing more than 100%. Um, the evidence suggests that they're actually getting less profitable over that point. Um, uh, limited economies of size, as we looked at, that's not new. David Becker was talking about this, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so if we're not going to be the US, what do we need to be clear about? What is our competitive advantage? And that is basically three things. High pasture harvest, low cost per hectare, and being clear about what is the value of additional capital. Okay, it's very easy when, you, uh, when you've got... Uh, strongish cash flow is, oh, what, what new toys can I buy um, uh, to uh, put more milk in the vat? And we see that um, uh, leading to that systems creep uh, that makes more milk, doesn't make much, uh, much more in the way of profit, um, but is contributing to you know, footprint um, in the water and the greenhouse gas space. So that's not of a strategic benefit to the sector. Um, pasture harvest and profit, um, nothing surprising here. Um, more pasture, um, pasture and crop eaten is more profit. Um, definitely focusing on the pasture component here. Um, dairy base um, doesn't split out pasture and crop, but it does have the area of, for example, grazed crop and, uh, sorry, the area of harvested um, crop and harvested crop does increase the amount of feed that you can harvest, but it doesn't increase the profitability. So definitely focusing on the pasture component of that homegrown feed. So what's been happening in this space? Um, if we look at um, the trends in pasture harvest, so New Zealand, yay, is at a high level. Um, not so exciting is that the um, trend is basically static. Okay. Well, what's worse than being high and static? Um, low and static, so uh, Uruguay and Argentina um, falling into that category. Um, if we look at Australia, Australia has been pretty, or the Victorian part of Australia at least, has been pretty flat. Um, but here we see an up and comer, Ireland, where they've been really focused on this pasture harvest and uh, Chagas, um, the uh, agricultural research uh, group over there, uh, they've been very clear about how, uh, well, what they think the best system is 
for Ireland. You know, there's a more park dairy system. Uh, if you want to do this, we'll help you all we can. You want to do something else, go for your life. But um, yeah, uh, you're on your own. Um, and so they've made incredible progress. Um, and here's a couple other places that are making progress. So Tasmania's um, a part of Australia um, making progress um, despite uh, um, uh, well, this has been taped, isn't it? So I won't say anything about the um, uh, high-level strategy in Australia or the lack thereof. Um, but South Africa, another clear standout here. I mean, that progress is just incredible, OK? And that is really getting back to, um, you know, the basics of what is the system that works over there. It's getting the stocking rate right. It's introducing irrigation where it's profitable to do so. Um, you know, that's just astounding, astounding progress. Um, oh, I mentioned a little bit about this before. Is, is cropping going to boost your yield? And, you know, we've seen benefits in fodder beet for wintering, you know, massive yields, um, easy to implement, cost effective. Um, but on the flip side, you know, more crop um, can reduce profitability. Um, so an optimisation model uh, we worked with in Australia showed that to be the case. Um, there's uh, McDonald's uh, uh, did some work with a different uh, stocking rate and different nitrogen use trials. And the low stocking rate, low stocking rate was actually the appropriate stocking rate. Um, 200N was better than any of the imported or maize silage options. Um, we've seen in Australia, like example of cropping systems performing better than grass, but it was a relatively small gap and they're very complex systems. So I think we, we do want to stay away from the complexity um, where where the value uh, proposition is pretty low. Um, yeah, and uh, I talked a little bit about the dairy base. The summer crop area um, increases the dry matter harvested, but doesn't do much for your profit. OK, so that was the pasture harvest. Um, what do we know about the um, cost, um, cost structure and how that's been trending over time? Um, so the good news is that New Zealand is still low on this operating cost metric. Um, you know, everything's gone up over time with inflation, etc. Um, some places have gone up uh, much faster than others. Um, and if we put in the US at a much higher level um, and increasing as well, uh, but Ireland, you know, through that strategic focus, have actually been able to pull costs um, out of their system. And yes, they were constrained by quota, etc. Um, in the earlier in the earlier periods, but you know, they could have done exactly. They could have ended up in the same place as Australia, with um, no focus and basically flatlining pasture and um, making milk and no money. Um, but they haven't because they had that focus. Um, and then. What, do we, what else do we know? So there's, we're putting operating costs in the system, but it requires capital to operate these systems. So the economic cost um, takes into account the value of the capital that goes into the system. And so we know that land in New Zealand is relatively expensive compared to the capital, um, compared to the capital that you have to put into a US system, for example. And so when you account for this um, uh, capital cost, then you're seeing that those costs um, get a lot closer together. And indeed, the US, uh, that's the average for the US. You would have to think that the best, um, uh, most efficient um, producers in the US would be getting close to the New Zealand average. So this is not a time to be complacent about where New Zealand needs to be in terms of competitiveness. So in summary, um, yeah, competitiveness uh, for the dairy sector at least means it's triple focus, pasture harvest, cost control, and being disciplined with capital investment. And what we really um, need to uh, keep working on is that feed base that is resilient to you know, climate. We're always gonna have climatic challenges, um, particularly in the um, uh, North Island, for example, and the 
markets, you know, milk prices are going to go up, milk prices are going to go down. You know, that's the reality. And we're always going to have these footprint um, pressures. They're not going to not going to go away. So I suspect the answer is primarily a direct grazed perennial, you know, ryegrass, um, clover, or you know, you might incorporate plantain, you might incorporate something else, but we're not uh, we're not seeing anything at this point that takes us away from you know this is this is the place where we need to be. Yep, thank you. So I guess stand in front of the microphone. Just a, a few reflections on the day, um, and um, and I'll keep this brief. Uh, so the first thing uh, I thought about was the messages from our practitioners in the morning sessions. So the people, the farmers, and the people who are working closely with farmers. Uh, and they talked about unashamedly stolen from your slides, folks. Um, people, planet, performance, and I've just kind of expanded those out a bit more. We talked about the importance of people, and I think we've reflected on that during the day. There were questions about what's stopping data interoperability, and the answer was people. Uh, there were questions about how do we get adoption, uh, and we talked about the need for specialists, and so a lot of it comes back to the importance of people in our thinking. Uh, mathematical equations are great, but people are very important. Um, planet, we've talked about, the need to make sure that we're farming within the constraints that we've got and doing the right things for our land and our planet. Performance, and I've added, and productivity there, and, you know, Martin's questions are good ones. We, we want to include, we want to, we know we often fall into talking about in, improving production, right? And we know we don't want to talk about improving production, we want to talk about improving productivity the measure of what we're getting out and at the bottom line measure of that is profit as long as the, the other factors are equal um, for the amount of inputs put in and for the uh, amount of emissions going out. Um, then something that I got out of those farmers who talked this morning is their strong emphasis on planning, on the processes that they and their teams follow the communication of those processes and the precision with which they go and measure, they, they identify what are the important things for them to measure in their systems and they go and measure them. And to, together that, you know, that was talked about as systematization, turning things into a system that's repeatable and I think that's, that's key. So some great, great learnings for me in those areas today. Um, we talked, for those who are involved in um, research and in governance, we talked about capabilities. And I guess my reflection, um, thinking about uh, some of the presentations, was the amount of amazing capability that we've had leveraged in this sector over many years in our science R&D and all of the, the things that underpin that, um, some fantastic capability. And I think that goes to the heart of what you were talking about before, Graham, um, other countries are investing in their core competencies and in New Zealand we've made a lot of investment, not, not enough, but a lot of investment in building capability in pastoral agriculture and its underpinnings, which has been fantastic. There's some really valuable collections. We talked about the virtual climate stations, we talked about SMAPs, and we've talked about some of the other collections that are out there. Um, I didn't want to just say databases because there's a lot more than just databases. Um, almost every speaker talked about the opportunity to collaborate further, to engage further, to use data from other sources, whether that's climate stations or soils data or any of the other data sets that are potential to use, um, and the opportunity to engage together. And we see that. We see that in some of the collaborative projects that have been done. We talked a bit, little bit about data integration, and to me there's some real benefits in being able to link data and to have common identifiers and all of those necessary things that make it easier to connect the dots between systems and also consistency in meaning and interpretation and are we talking about the same things. 
Uh, and then this afternoon we talked about our, and you, you know, I'm playing some fun games here, but we talked a, we talked a little bit about um, uh, sensing. We started off by talking from space, which is very much built on sensing technologies. But I thought, particularly when I was listening to Dean as well, there's a, there's, that's another great example of sourcing data uh, so that farmers aren't having to go and measure it. You know, imagine if you as a farmer, and farmers did have to do this, some still do, go and attend every sale yard that they can so that they know what the prices are. Try and keep their own little book so that they know, you know, where prices are heading. But there are tools that can deliver that data just as space can deliver pasture cover data. Um, and, and I think we saw through the work that Ravensdown and Balance are doing a bunch of other sensing and use of predictive tools to take some of the effort that farmers would have out of sort of capturing data and making sense of it. A lot of the tools we looked at, uh, including FarmMax and including the tools that, that Ravensdown and Balance have been working on, have been around making predictions that help people make either recommendations or decisions, and that's really powerful. And I think there was, there's been some, again, a thread of discussion going through around, well, how do we then extend those services out? If you've got other, other crops you want to measure with, with space, how do you do that? Can we extend those services? If you've got some data that's in FarmMax or one of these other tools, how do we make it available? How do we make data flow into FarmMax? I think my other observation is that we're still at the stage where many of these tools maybe space being an exception here, require the assistance of somebody, a specialist, to help interpret them. Right? Whether that's a, a rep or an agri-manager in a fertiliser company, and we know there's good reasons why we should be doing that, uh, or, or a consultant to help you with farm max. And, and I'm not saying, you know, we know those roles are essential and important, but if we to move to support for adoption and use, we need to think about how we kind of leverage the time of those people, right? So that they're doing the things that only they can do and that our tools and our systems are easier to use so that um, specialists don't have to get involved at every step in the way. So I guess that's my kind of reflections on what we've talked about today. I hope that, like me, this has been of interest to you, that you've had your eyes opened to some interesting things that people have been doing and some opportunities. Um, I think it's been great to have the input from the farmers and the practitioners to kind of ground truth what the problems are that we're trying to solve. And what we're hoping is that this conversation continues on. So if you're on Zoom or if you're here in the room, hopefully you've made some contacts or you've made some notes of people you should talk to and we'd really encourage you to continue to do that. If there's any way that Rosier can f facilitate those discussions for you, we're happy to do that as well. So thank you very much.